Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Gruber. I am a white settler of Jewish Ashkenazi descent, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm also the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge the harms of the past, which continue in the present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Whenever land acknowledgements are read, I always like to think of, what does that mean to me? How can I move forward in reconciliation? I think you know, by having the dialogue that we're going to have today is a good place to start as well. So on February 6, Robin D'Angelo will be at the University of Manitoba to deliver the Robert and Elizabeth Knight <coughs> Distinguished Visiting Lecture on White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. I want to welcome everyone to today's sessions on how to guide for difficult conversations about white whiteness. So we have two sessions. We have a panel presentation and then a workshop after that. And these events are brought to you by Ongamazin and the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So if you look around, you'll see there's lots of action happening. This is how we normally do things. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we are videotaping uh, the panel presentation, and also there is a live stream as well that is happening too. Um, so just thinking as we move forward today, we know that anti-black and anti-indigenous racism impacts admissions, impacts faculty and staff who are present at the university campus, impacts people in terms of safety and how comfortable they feel to be here as well. And we also know it impacts who stay here and ultimately patient care too. We also know when white fragility is addressed, the response can lead to a range of defensive moves as well. So how do we move forward in having these necessary conversations? So today's panel will discuss how whiteness and white fragility are expressed in the university and healthcare context, the links between white fragility, anti-black and anti-indigenous racism, and the imperative of disruption to support equal rights to the highest attainable standards of health as well. So it is my honor and privilege to introduce today's panel members. So we have here Dr. Ian Wetter, who is the co-director, Office of Community Engagement and Social Accountability Lead for Undergraduate Medical Education. We have Dr. Delia Douglas, who is the Anti-Racism Practice Lead for Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And Dr. Marsha Anderson, who's the Executive Director, Indigenous Academic Affairs, and the newly appointed Vice Dean of Indigenous Health. So just a yeah. thank you. <laughs> Each member will speak for a specific period of time, and thereafter we will have opportunity for some questions and dialogue. So I'm just going to pass it out, okay? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Ian Wetter. Um, I am a settler of Scottish and English descent, um, and I go by the pronouns he and him. And I just, I, when I think about this land and my relationship to this land, um, in my family lineage, um, my family came here as farmers, but there's a direct line between the violent removal of indigenous people from the land and my family. So I discovered in my grandmother's journal a note about uh, my great uncle who had taken up arms against the people, the Ojibwe people of the Rolling River First Nation, um, when the Rolling River First Nations people were expressing their um, anger that their land had been uh, taken over by, uh, by local farmers, Scottish farmers in particular. And so there is a direct line from the violent removal of indigenous people from the land um, and my uh, success and my wellness. Um, and I benefit every single day from that. And what I'd like to talk a little bit about is how we as white people benefit every single day from the violent removal of indigenous people from the land um, and from anti-black and anti-indigenous racism. So, great. So I just am very quickly going to talk about this. I'm, I'm assuming that you're all here because you buy into the fact that we've got a problem um, that needs to be solved. But just in case that wasn't incredibly obvious, there's a recent study from the fall of 2019 from the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and the First Nations Health and Social Services Secretariat of Manitoba which essentially reveals that the gap between the health outcomes for white people, uh, or sorry, all other Manitobans and Indigenous people in Manitoba is widening. 
and there's an 11 year gap. So on the time that a child is born, there is an anticipated 11 year gap in life expectancy. Now, that, we sometimes try to explain that away and we will call these from now on detours or white detours. So white people, ooh, that doesn't look good, um, <laughs> tend to uh, try to explain away the impacts of whiteness and white supremacy. And I would like us at the end of today to stop trying to explain that away. Um, when this image comes back, I what I was going to talk about is that we sometimes try to explain this away as geography. So very often when I'm talking to students about this, they'll say, well, the reason for that difference is because reserves are so far away from Winnipeg, and so the geography causes the difference in health outcomes. But you maybe recently saw the WRHA uh, community health assessment report that showed that there is an 18 year difference in life expectancy between people who live in South Point Douglas um, and people who live in Inkster West. So we need to stare at that and be very, very uncomfortable. Um, and so I think um, what I wanna just drive home is that if we want health equity, and if we want equity in all kinds of other things like economic equity or equity and access to opportunity, then we have to address racism, full stop. And when I say racism, I wanna be super clear that we need to um, make a distinction, and Robin D'Angelo does a good job of doing this, between prejudice, discrimination, and racism. So prejudice is that I have an idea about you and your people that's come from my background, and I think negative things about you because of my prejudice. Discrimination is the behavior that I engage in based on those thoughts. Racism is a different thing. Racism is a system. Racism is the structure that gets created to maintain that system in place. And so if I am talking to you about racism and you're talking to me about discrimination, we're gonna be talking past each other. And that's where the idea of reverse racism comes up. Say, well, this person who was black or brown or indigenous was mean to me, therefore that's reverse racism. That is not possible. You need to have power and structures. So a person who's black or brown or, uh, uh, or indigenous cannot impact my ability to get employment, cannot impact how I get paid, cannot impact um, my access to education, whereas white systems can do that. Where are we at? Okay, great. I don't know if this will advance. Okay, so this just gets at the point that Patrick Wolf has made um, in the past that colonialism is a structure and not an event. And if we think about it as an event, we can say, well, I wasn't here then, so that has nothing to do with me. I don't have any work to do, I don't have any responsibility, and I don't have to feel that icky feeling of guilt because it has nothing to do with me. Um, whereas if we think about it as a structure that we benefit from every single day, then we are actually implicated. And you might say, okay, but you're making me feel guilty, which I would say a person can't make you feel guilty, you feel guilty because of the situation. But I would like you to be able to turn that guilt into its very useful cousin, which is responsibility. And so if you're feeling that icky feeling of guilt, I would like you to say, what is that telling me about the responsibility, about the work that I have to do? And so if we're thinking about the work that we have to do, Yes, um, this is the work we have to do. We have to make whiteness and white privilege visible. And what I mean by that is whiteness are kind of all the aspects that come into being white. It's about how we're enculturated as being white. And we don't talk about whiteness, um, and that's a real problem. When we talk about blackness or indigeneity, we also need to be talking about whiteness. And if you just think about the way that we write in a clinical record, we write 34-year-old female, but if the person happens to be indigenous, we write 34-year-old indigenous female. And so I think we need to really think about that because what that does, if we don't identify whiteness, is that we think about it as the norm. Um, and if you think about that example of the focus group that they did when they were making the new $100 bill, there was a woman who uh, looked, uh, was Chinese appearing, looking into a microscope, and they did a focus group, and the focus group said, we think that the person should look more ethnically neutral. <laughs> and now she looks white. Um, not that I've seen a hundred dollar bill, but <laughs> I've seen that's, that's what's on there. Um, and so, um, and part of that socialization is the socia socialization to feel superior. And when they look at kids and get their sense of when did you sort of have a sense of your own race, firstly, it happens much later for white people than um, black, indigenous, and people of color. But when white people become aware of their race, they perceive themselves as superior. And that starts from childhood. And if we don't look at that socialization and what uh, Joe Fegan calls the white racial frame, um, um, then we actually will miss our opportunity for action. 
And the way that the white racial frame, and that's the, how we come to see the world the way we do. It comes from movies. It comes from the dolls that we played with as kids. It comes from media. It comes from <clears throat> academic journal publications. It is everywhere. And that white racial frame affects the way that we see the entire world. Now, one of the things about the, the white racial frame is that it is maintained by invisibility. So as long as it remains invisible, it will persist. So our job is just to repeatedly make it visible, make it visible, make it visible, talk about whiteness. I'm gonna talk about this model in, in just a moment. So this model um, comes from Stephanie Nixon, was published in BMC Public Health uh, in December of 2019, and she calls it the COIN model. And the importance of the COIN model is she said, we historically as healthcare providers perceive people who are oppressed, facing structural barriers, sometimes we refer to them as vulnerable or marginalized, as needing our help. And if we help them, then they can become privileged just like us, and the problem is solved. But it leaves the actual structure of inequality totally untroubled, and it also leaves our privilege totally unexamined. And so what we need to do if we're going to examine this is we need to say, okay, so the, the fact that people are, um, are suffering from structural barriers or oppression, is because of my privilege, and that those two things are related. And so that makes us think, okay, so what are the ways every day that I have un unearned advantages because of the color of my skin, and what can I do to push back against those? And then the collective project, instead of helping people to cross onto the other side of the coin, the collective project actually becomes to remove the coin altogether, to dismantle the coin. And so what I'm hoping today is that we can get into the project of figuring out how we're gonna dismantle the structure. And the, in this case, this system of inequality is white supremacy. And then there are interlocking systems of oppression. So sexism and classism and cisgenderism all intersect so that they actually create real barriers for people. And you might be on different sides of a coin. In one situation, you might be on the class the positive side of the class side of the coin, but you might be on the other side on the race side of the coin. So um, just moving on to the, the next slide, what I want to talk a little bit uh, about is this. So these posters went up all over campuses across the US in Manitoba. They appeared in, I think, November of 2018 for the first time. They reappeared sort of persistently since then. And the sign says simply, it's okay to be white. And so you might say, okay, whatever, no big deal. So there's a couple of things about this sign. One is this sign came from 4chan, so the internet forum for white supremacists. Well, it's, it's an internet forum for lots of people, but white supremacists spend a lot of time on that forum, and they promoted the dissemination of this message across college campuses. So this is directly related to white power, white nationalism, and the alt-right. But I think there's actually a more troubling manifestation of this that I think we need to consider what that means for all of us, and that is that it's a manifestation of white fragility. So when black, indigenous, or people of color say, we want equality, we say, yeah, we want equality for everyone too. And then if people say to us, your unexamined privilege maintain the system of oppression, white supremacy, that makes our advancement difficult or impossible, then we say, we feel this icky feeling of guilt, and we say, oh, but it's okay to be white. In the same way that when black youth are being shot by police, and they say black lives matter, we say, well, but don't all lives matter? That is a manifestation of white fragility. Um, and where right, white fragility comes from, and the reason that it's such a serious problem, is it comes from this feeling of guilt, and we want to escape that feeling of responsibility. Because if we feel a sense of responsibility, we're implicated. We have to do something. We cannot maintain the status quo. And so, um, and so if we're saying it's okay to be white, the, Robin D'Angelo appropriately describes this as a form of racial bullying and an exercising of social dominance. So when we cry or we become argumentative or we push back when people say, I want my rights to be respected, we are actually exercising in a form of social dominance or bullying and we actually need to get our shit together um, and be willing to be in that conversation. And Robin D'Angelo suggests, um, uh, I'm just gonna read this little phrasing that she suggests because I think it's bang on. How am I doing for time, Jackie? Um, Over? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to read this, and then, uh, and then I will stop. So, um, so she says, uh, racism, racism is the norm rather than the aberration. Feedback is key to our ability to recognize and repair our inevitable and often unaware collusion with racism. 
In recognition of this, I try to follow these guidelines. One, how, where, and when you give me feedback is irrelevant. It is the feedback I want and need. Understanding that it is hard to give, I will take it any way I can get it. From my position of social, cultural, and institutional white power and privilege, I am perfectly safe and I can handle it. If I cannot handle it, it's on me to build my racial stamina. Thank you. Dr. Delia Douglas. Oh, looking up on the desk. Oh, there we go. Okay. Good afternoon. The clock is on. <laughs> <clears throat> we live in a present created by dispossession, genocide, enslavement, and ongoing settler colonial projects. Today I want to speak to you about these histories of violence, racial violence, and I'm going to consider how history is lived. <clears throat> and I ask that you consider how history is alive and that remembering and forgetting are ongoing racial projects. The findings from the recent Race Relations in, survey, in Canada survey of public opinion and experience reveal that two-thirds believe that race relations are better in Canada than the U.S. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Canadians see racism as prejudiced attitudes of individuals rather than systemic or foundational to the country's laws and institutions. Indigenous peoples followed by blacks are groups seen as most likely to experience frequent discrimi discrimination. Indigenous peoples are less likely to see race relations as good or improved. And lastly, the survey found that black folk see race as undermining their ability to succeed. My focus today on the nature of Indigenous and Black encounters with each other and with the Canadian settler colonial nation remains a difficult and incomplete conversation and one that is undoubtedly untidy. I recognize that there are other racialized minority groups that are part of Canada's past and present. My focus today, however, is on Black and Indigenous folk. Black and Indigenous communities are connected through enslavement, colonialism, white supremacy, oppression, and genocide. We have been and continue to be systematically targeted for death. <clears throat> Various institutional arrangements, practices, and ideologies have been used to subordinate and isolate Indigenous and Black communities and prevent us from recognizing points of connection. As the late Audre Lorde and many others have persuasively demonstrated, to make connections across our differences, there must be some awareness of the histories, the laws, and other systems that have brought us together and have kept us apart. <clears throat> oh, I have to do this now. Okay. So the following two epigraphs are going to guide my discussion. The first by Kristen Myers is that racism turns people into things, separating them from their humanity. People come to be seen as disposable. And Dion Brand, unlike the United States, where there is at least an admission of the fact that racism exists and has a history, in this country one is faced with a stupefying innocence. I like the, the sounds. <laughs> so returning to Dr. Wetter's discussion of settler colonialism as an ongoing structure and not an historical event, in both the past and the present, the structures, the social relations, and practices of settler colonialism and white supremacy have sought to remove and replace indigenous populations to control land, resources, and people by any means necessary. To put it simply, the Canadian settler colonial state achieves stability and creates wealth at the expense of Indigenous peoples. It's also important to recognize that Canada's dispossession of Indigenous land and people was funded in part through the labor of enslaved Africans. The colonies throughout the Americas generated wealth that benefited Britain, mm -hmm. France, and other imperial powers. Despite the country's history of racial violence, Canada's national identity and renown is that of a multicultural country. <clears throat> one dedicated to social justice both within and beyond its borders. As Shireen Razek explains, and I quote, the official mythologies of white nation states are narratives of innocence. Through dint of hard work, the settler conquered the wilderness, the colonizer civilized the natives, end quote. In this context, formal multiculturalism and the fact of a diverse population are associated with national narratives of virtue and that Canada is a safe haven. In this context, white British and French settler colonial subjects recognize themselves as the rightful inheritors of status, identity, and power in Canada. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about enslavement because it's a foundational moment in the history of white anti-black racism. The Atlantic slave trade involved the forced removal of millions of Africans, which created a diaspora, and the trade was fundamental to the economic and industrial development of Europe and North America and the simultaneous underdevelopment of Africa. As Sadia Hartman states, unique to the Atlantic slave trade was the immense scale of accumulating persons and the great violence and death required to produce wealth. Phenotypical blackness was the foundation for the institutionalization of people of African descent as property. Legally deemed subhuman, they were denied the dignity of complexity and diversity. A familiar story that is often repeated with pride and taught in school is that Upper Canada or Ontario was the final destination of the Underground Railroad, the place where black, the black enslaved escaped to freedom. Few know that enslavement was practiced in New France and British North America for over two centuries, and that the, practice, the pattern of black settlement extends across the country and dates back to the 1600s. Few know that in April 1734 in New France, an unceded and occupied Mohawk Ganawake territory, a black enslaved woman from Portugal, Marie Joseph Angelique, was arrested and charged with burning down the home of her enslaver, along with 45 other buildings, which is the equivalent of Old Montreal. Under torture, Angelique confessed to the crime and was publicly executed. Hung by the neck until dead, she was then burned, her ashes strewn to the wind. I mention Angelique because her alleged arson and punishment, her torture, trial, the verdict, and her execution ensures a black presence in a white nation that claims to have a blackless past. People of African descent were enslaved during the course of the French regime, which lasted until 1760. In New France, enslaved blacks were the personal property of prominent settlers, including colonial administrators, clergy, and merchants. When the French surrendered to the British in 1760, the law decreed that black and indigenous peoples would remain enslaved or the sellable property of their French and British owners. In British North America, as Canada was known during its period of British colonization, from 1760 to 1867, the chattel status of blacks was maintained as they continued to be enslaved in domestic spheres and as general laborers. Note that the trade was declared illegal across the British Empire in 1833. Ownership was not. Canada also benefited from the enslavement of Africans through profits accrued by the British Empire through traders of sugar and cotton. We are here because you were there. Black people did not give permission or agree to come here. They couldn't, they were enslaved. The presence of people of African descent throughout the Americas represents, to quote human rights lawyer Anthony Morgan, the forcibly displanted, or to quote Benita Lawrence and Zainab Amadahi, black people are stolen people on stolen land. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging enslavement as a Canadian institution is a significant political statement that requires that we recognize that black status and identity in Canada are connected to and influenced by the authorizing of this institutionalized anti-black racial violence. Recognition and celebration of the Underground Railroad bolsters Canada's self-image of racial harmony and benevolence. The pairing of these declarations of racial innocence with the violence of disavowal maintains a white national identity that grants expressions of anti-black racism an acceptability and a license. Collective memory has effectively purged the history of segregation that restricted blacks' access to schools, housing, and employment. Anti-black racism is revealed through the desecration of slave cemeteries in Ottawa, in, sorry, in Ontario and Quebec, the cross burnings on the property of black families in Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and New Brunswick. <laughs> Dr. Anderson is being called. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the torching of the Black Loyal Society building and the firebombing of the Black Cultural Center in Nova Scotia. My point here is that there's a link between the historical and contemporary manifestations of anti-blackness. <clears throat> we are talking about a history that sought to erase and or eliminate Indigenous people and own and sell black people. Returning to my opening comments about how the past is remembered matters and the question of how is history lived, I offer you two examples the child welfare system, and mass incarceration. Mm 
Might be manual. Got to go old school. Thank you kindly. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> I won't read the numbers, but I'll just speak to them. So the forced removals, the dislocations and relocations that are a result of dispossession, of enslavement, of segregation, residential schools, the 60s scoop, they take new forms in the present via the child welfare system and mass incarceration. Black and indig indigenous children and youth are overrepresented, as you can see from the following statistics. Indigenous and black families experience greater percentages of referrals for investigation, over-monitoring, and greater numbers of decisions of removals of children from their homes. Oh, thank you. So with respect to mass incarceration, black and indigenous folk are overrepresented in prisons across the country. We are overrepresented as the accused, the convicted, and the incarcerated. We are the fastest growing subgroups in corrections, and we are underrepresented as lawyers and judges. Indigenous women make up 33% of the incarcerated female population, yet comprise 4.5% of the Canadian population. Black women make up 9% of the prison population and comprise 3% of the Canadian female population. All new net growth in the offender population in the last five years is the result of the incarceration of Indigenous, Black, and members of other racialized minority groups. The white offender population has remained stable for the last five years. It's also important to note that the majority of Indigenous Black women who have been incarcerated are mothers have been subjects of sexual and physical abuse, and have been incarcerated for non-violent crimes. The impact of mass incarceration is, of course, multifaceted. The overrepresentation of black and indigenous folk in prison stifles discussions of poverty, inadequate access to proper education, housing, health care, underemployment, reducing it to a discourse of criminality and danger. Our communities are underprotected underserviced and over-policed. These unprecedented rates of imprisonment indicate how anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism continues to render us disposable. I would suggest that the disappearing of Indigenous and Black people to prison under the guise of maintaining law and order masks how whites are configured as law-abiding and virtuous. And Indigenous and Black folk are upheld as a threat to so-called Canadian values and to the Canadian settler nation state. The overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black folk in the child welfare system and in prison represent new forms of containment that protect and sustain white settler colonialism and heteropatriarchy. For Black and Indigenous folk, these are encounters with what Bell Hooks calls the terrorizing force of white supremacy. I'm disrupting the white gaze here. For black and indigenous folk, there is essentially no recognition of what Hooks describes as the traumatic pain and anguish that are the result of past and present white settler colonial projects and heteropatriarchy. So I want to close, oh, I'm under time, by speaking to the activism of progressive resistant movements such as Idle No More, Am I Next, Black Lives Matter, and Me Too. These movements have all been created by women and making visible two-spirit, trans, LGBTB, QQIA, and those who live along the gender spectrum. Crucially, these movements affirm the lives of Indigenous and Black women and girls as targets of and resistors to oppression. To bring this back to where we live now, our struggles, our futures, and our liberation are linked. The potential from strategic solidarity against white supremacy and settler colonialism is transformative. Simply put, we are stronger together than apart. We need to turn to one another rather than against each other. Remember that divide and conquer is a strategy out of the colonial playbook. Thanks very much. You didn't have to get the signal. <laughs> now, Dr. Marsha Anderson. I, um, I'm going to talk about why this matters here. And sometimes when we use examples like mass child apprehension, 
and mass incarceration. The risk is it allows us to see these as things that are separate from us. All right. And oh, no, back one slide. Thank you. And um, one of the big challenges that I've experienced in the 15 years I've been doing this work within health professional education and healthcare systems is this strongly held myth that the walls of our institution are impermeable to the impacts of racism and white supremacy. That we actually operate in colorblind ways. We treat everybody the same. I was actually doing uh, neuroscience rounds last week and I had presented not a ton, but you know, convincing evidence of a pattern of unequal healthcare by race. And one of the questions that I got in the discussion period, which is a common question that I get, is, but we treat everyone the same here. You know, we have universal health care insurance. We, we don't see any difference. We treat everybody the same. And there are reasons why, despite being faced with a pattern of evidence that shows that's not the truth, we continue to believe that. And I would say that these are rooted in the interrelation of white identity development and the white frame, which Ian talked about, um, as well as this interplay with professional identity and professional identity development, especially in health professions, seeing ourselves as helpers, wanting to believe that we wake up in the morning, and, and this is probably true, with the intention of helping everybody, but holding on to that belief despite the evidence to the contrary, and weighing our own intentions and self-image over the impacts that we are actually having. And we need to stop seeing our walls as impermeable to the things that lead to the dehumanizing of black and indigenous folks and the mass incarceration and mass apprehension of indigenous kids. I think, you know, with some of my public health team who are here today, who, who are here today, hi folks, we have started to look at the population health impacts of racism in child welfare and racism in the justice system. I don't think we've actually talked as much about how that leads to white benefit. And that is part of the work that we need to do because systems are maintained not just because they harm us uh, and recreate Canada as a settler state, but because they benefit others, right? So our walls are not impermeable to these things. This particular graphic is from the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two Spirits. And it's a graphic about intersectionality, uh, which Ian and Delia both mentioned. But I'll draw your attention to where I've put the yellow arrow. Uh, and it's talking about these structural forces that lead to oppression. It says, institutions and structures that harm rather than heal. For example, health and justice. This notion, this idea, this experience of Indigenous peoples has been talked about and has evidence behind it in multiple, multiple times over multiple spaces um, and multiple places, right? They didn't just make this statement up. This is what they heard from the families of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks about their experiences encountering healthcare. We can think about the individual case of Tina Fontaine and how she was in a healthcare space within 24 hours of when she was murdered. We can think about the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. We can think about all of these studies that talk and document why Indigenous peoples on a daily basis are making a risk-benefit decision about if they come into a healthcare space, are they more likely to be further harmed or get the help that they need, right? And in a health professional education setting, we need to understand and take responsibility for the fact that we are training the health professionals and recreating the systems that lead to individual Indigenous people and families having to make a risk-benefit decision about whether it's more risky to come into a healthcare space or to avoid seeking healthcare. What happens out there whether we're talking about Colton Bushy or our relatives on the street who are suffering in the extreme cold, whether we're talking about mass incarceration or the mass apprehension of Indigenous kids, what happens out there happens in here. Indigenous people, whether they're here as patients, as learners, as families, as faculty, as staff, we are carrying our history and our present with us, and so are you. Right? 
we need to understand that this may not be who we want to be, but it is who we are. We are a site of creation and of recreation. The opportunity in that is then that we can be a site of interruption. We'll go to the next slide. My uh, friend Michael posted this on his Instagram yesterday. <laughs> it was a great reminder. Uh, it says, power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. <coughs> power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So when I think about health justice, I think about health professional education, health care, health outcomes that are rights-based. Our right to freedom from racism and freedom from all forms of discrimination and our right to the highest attainable standard of health. And that our efforts are rooted in the impacts and the outcomes that we are producing uh, and not in intention. Now, just a, qu a quick word about love in this, um, in this quote. One time, okay, so back in 2011, 2012, me and Mel uh, took over as senior leaders within the section of First Nations Bay and Inuit Health. We developed a strategic plan. Instead of the usual kind of Western business principles, we had these ways of being that were rooted in grandmother's teachings, including one about love. And so one day we went along with Margaret Lavallee uh, to present to Dean's Council who presented these ways of being. And there was a couple of deans who took real issue with this word love. And uh, one of the things that they said was, it might seem like we're promoting um, inappropriate sexual relationships between healthcare professionals and patients. And uh, Mel and I and Margaret kind of looked at each other. I don't know if Margaret remembers this. And we're like, well, we're pretty sure that would be an abuse of power and not an example of love, right? Mm. <laughs> and um, Margaret, oh, I'm not going to put you on the spot here. I'm just going to tell a story. We turned to Margaret and said, could you maybe provide a teaching about what we mean by love in this kind of context? And thinking back to some of the epigraphs that Delia shared, she talked about love in this setting being about recognizing and respecting our full humanity, mm. our common humanity, our interconnectedness, our place and our roles in creation. Racism is inherently dehumanizing with the force of power behind it that Ian had described. And that is what one of the things I found so powerful when I saw this quote yesterday again and leading towards this talk today. It's how we use that power and in love to achieve the justice that we need to and stop using power to abuse other people's humanity. Um, and so, I don't know, we might take this on as the, the quote that captures the spirit or the goal or the intent of all of the faculty's anti-racism work going forward. So if we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the opportunity that I see for us um, is to be a site of interruption. And whether you're part of this faculty or you're one of our partners uh, or a learner or a community member who works with us, we are all are in sites and spaces where we are participating in creating and recreating the status quo and therefore we, where we can participate in interrupting and dismantling the status quo. So this graphic uh, is from the Pan American Health Organization report on health inequalities in the Americas. Right? It's a conceptual framework for uh, actually explaining health gaps. And so uh, most social determinants of health frameworks only go to the conditions of daily life, right? And how the conditions of daily life, things like housing and income and education and access to health care, contribute to either health gaps or health equity, right? or health justice, however we might want to phrase that. What this conceptual framework acknowledges is that there is a host of structural drivers that actually create the conditions of daily life that we are living in. Um, oh, and my yellow arrow did not get reproduced here. So under structural drivers, I'll, I'll draw your attention. Okay, so the top one says political, social, 
cultural and economic structures. So including, for example, the impacts of capitalism and a free market kind of gone wild, so to speak, right? The next one down talks about natural environment, land, and climate change, undeniably important. And of course, these structural drivers are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're very inextricably linked. But the third one, which is the one that we've been focusing on today, is the history and legacy of ongoing colonialism and structural racism, okay? At the bottom, it says taking action. So if we are gonna take effective action, we can't just try to intervene on the conditions of daily life. If we pretend like the structural drivers and racism don't matter, we are never gonna make significant impact to those conditions of daily life. We need to take governance and human rights-based action, not just at the conditions of daily life, but also on addressing those underlying structural drivers, the motors that are creating the inequalities that we see, okay? Now, when I was considering this and our space and our responsibility, I was thinking also about the scale of healthcare gaps, all right? So 17 years ago, the Institute of Medicine did this mass report on racial healthcare gaps, a uh, big, huge meta-analysis almost. Um, and pretty much every study that ever looks for a gap in healthcare quality by race finds one. I think I've seen one study one time in one specific place that did not show evidence of a healthcare gap by race. And we're talking about things like length of time to be seen in an emergency room, access to dialysis uh, and kidney transplantation, access to angiograms within 24 hours of having a myocardial infarction, um, pain control for things like kidney stones and long bone fractures, like really necessary acute medical care. And then of course also primary care differences and long-term care differences. And like there is a mass, mass spectrum of unequal care by race. Now, in order to show these gaps, which can be differences anywhere from 25 to 50% or more depending on the site and the type of healthcare being provided, but really massive gaps. We are talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of healthcare encounters where individuals receive unequal healthcare. And if we think about the number of healthcare providers who are involved in a single, let's say, emergency room visit that leads to an admission or a surgery, for every single healthcare encounter, we're talking about easily 10 to 30 members of the healthcare team who are involved, which means we are talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of healthcare providers who on a daily basis are colluding, are participating in unequal healthcare by race, all right? Now, we are an educational institution that trains multiple different types of healthcare professionals. So if we were to reframe this diagram and say we are committed to providing, to training a different kind of healthcare professional who will interrupt the current status quo and be able not only to provide high quality, anti-racist, culturally safe healthcare, but also to lead teams and systems change so that we are bringing everyone along, right? If that is the healthcare professional that we want to train, then we need to examine not necessarily our conditions of daily life right now, but maybe our conditions of daily learning. Who are the students that we are admitting? How is that recreating the status quo or interrupting the status quo? Who are we hiring? Faculty, staff. How is that recreating or how is that interrupting the status quo? Who is getting promoted? Okay, myself excluded. Who is getting promoted? <laughs> and what does that say about whether we are recreating or interrupting? What is the policy environment? Is there a specific anti-racism policy? Do BIPOC learners actually use the specific anti-racism policy because it is safe and effective in addressing racism? Is there transparent reporting that helps lead to organizational culture shift around racism, right? How are we examining and making visible the hidden curriculum around white supremacy? How are we challenging it? These are all things we might think about as the conditions of daily learning that will allow us to achieve our goals and our commitment to train healthcare professionals who can provide high quality, culturally safe, equitable, anti-racist healthcare. And then 
If we want to shift those conditions of daily learning, that's where we need to come back to these conversations around white supremacy and right fragility and understand those structural drivers that are producing those mass inequalities outside of our system are also producing the mass inequalities within our system. If I can have the last slide. So moving forward, a few things that I would just say and guide us before we head to a few questions. First of all, uh, let's really be mindful and conscious of what is being centered in our classrooms, in our meetings, in our discussions, right? I think we need to very consciously take an approach that is rights-based and centers the experience of BIPOC learners, <laughs> faculty, and staff in our learning environment. And this means specifically decentering whiteness and white fragility. And that leads to my, my next point. There is a reason why we had Ian be the one to talk about whiteness and lay all of that groundwork. And that is because of the responsibility for whiteness to speak back to whiteness and take on the work of dismantling it. You know, I was at a, did a panel you know, a few months ago at a conference, um, and it was on women's leadership in medicine, uh, and I had done some work challenging the unnamed white women's leadership in medicine, nature of how it was planned and rolling out. And in the end, the white woman cried um, and uh, got a lot of comfort and all that. And there's a section in the book on white women's tears that I think is actually important to read. Uh, and there was a learner who said to this very senior woman who is crying, um, it's not that your feelings don't matter, it's that we're not going to center it right now, right? Your feelings matter. They're valid. It's important that you move through that. We're not going to do it in the, in the middle of our meetings where it is functioning as a detour from the real work that needs to be done, okay? So that is what I mean by offline support for working through fragility and emotional reactions. And then peer accountability when attempts to recenter whiteness occur. Uh, so again, when I say peer accountability, I'm talking about that whiteness speaking back to whiteness. And the reason for that is we really need to be able to invest our energy as black and indigenous leaders in leading the work and doing the work. As we dismantle whiteness and do this rights-based work, we need to be able to self-determine what that looks like. And we can't do that if we're taking on that work of managing the whiteness. So I am going to leave it there, and uh, we will open it up for some questions. So we, we have about 10 minutes um, for questions, and I'm just wondering, before we do take questions, if you could just turn to your neighbor and talk about what question you would like to ask. In essence, peer review the question to make sure, number one, that it is a question, number two, that will contribute to the dialogue. So just take a minute to do that, please. Oh, great work. Oh my goodness. That is so good. Oh. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to say. if you could raise your hand and Jackie will bring you a mic just for the live streaming okay. yeah oh surprise <laughs> are there any questions okay. we'll just ask you to please introduce yourself as well thank you hi my name is Patty Thill I'm a sociologist, but faculty member in physical therapy. Um, my question is, so I'm, this is actually, I do work on stigma, not anti-racism, but the relationship is, um, those, those, those speak to each other. My question is, is there any, 
organization happening among white faculty members to start doing this work across colleges? And if so, like who and how do we connect in? Because some of us, we can each do it in our little colleges, but there seems to be something that could be more uh, dispersed. Can we take that? Do you get that? Um, as far as I know, that I am not in those. I'm in lots of those conversations, but not in an organized way. Um, if somebody know, out there knows that that already exists, then I want to join that group um, and continue the conversation. And if it doesn't exist yet, let's start it. Um, does it exist already? Does anybody know? There's Gawidji de Young. Oh, yes. Gawidji de Young is Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples walking together, helping each other. And it's a group. Uh, there's representation from the uh, Selkirk Avenue, inner city social work, the faculties here on Bannatyne campus and on the Fort Gary campus. So we'll make sure that that information gets out to you. Thank you. Any other questions? You were all talking. Oh, <laughs> My name is Erwin Suchik. I'm a student here and faculty here at the university. Uh, my question is just regarding who might we uh, guide people towards in the event that um, there's perhaps racism issues that mm -hmm. to discuss. Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure how to phrase that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, really quickly, I can run down what there is currently. Um, so right now, kind of the options are, depending on where you're located, there's the Speak Up button and the Associate Dean of Professionalism in the College of Medicine. There is also the Office of Human Rights and Conflict Resolution uh, that one can go through and do an intake interview and talk about different informal and formal processes that are available. I think Jackie is, as the Director of the Office of Equity, my mic just fell, Equity, um, Diversity and Inclusion is, is, has an open door to try to assist people with identifying avenues. In theory, your uh, department head or program director should be a resource to at least guide you in that way. I have a pretty open door policy, although my schedule is hectic, so I do a fair bit of that, particularly for Indigenous learners. All of those are the avenues I would say that are currently available. That being said, we do recognize that those processes uh, are insufficient for experiences of racism. And so that's one of the key reasons that Delia was hired actually is to help us specifically describe an anti-racism strategy, including a specific anti-racism policy and process. Um, she's already started some consultations with learners and with others around what would make the process more safe and effective. Uh, so stay tuned and hopefully within the next year we will have a more robust and specific uh, process for, for responding to racism. Thank you so much. And, and just for, for uh, white people who are struggling with their feelings, I do spend time attending to white feelings um, because I see <laughs> that as our work. Thank um, you. And I, and I, but I'm only interested in doing it insofar as people want to attend to their feelings so they can get into the fight, so they can like get into the dismantling of white supremacy. And if people are not ready for that part and have lots of feelings, I'm also happy to sort of hear people out, but I might redirect you to some resources and some reading. Um, and then if you're ready to get into the fray, then, uh, then we can talk about how to be strategic about doing that. But I'm happy to also do that. I'm uh, Sharon McDonald. I'm um, a physician by background. And uh, you talk about education. So much of our education uh, in the health sciences is, uh, is on, in work sites, obviously, hospitals mm -hmm. and other places. How, uh, how do you see the educational stuff mm -hmm. uh, transposed into or start working with the sites mm -hmm. um, to begin the same work. Mm 
Yeah, absolutely. So that's the challenge of the clinical learning environment. Of course, most of our placements are within the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, but really province-wide and broader. And I know some of the frustration from Barry and Linda, Mandy and Adina now with running the undergraduate longitudinal course is when everything that students are learning in the classroom seems to be undone uh, by what they're learning outside of the classroom and particularly in the clinical learning environment. So I think, you know, we need to continue to build our relationships and be strategic and having leadership positions that cross uh, the health professional colleges and the service delivery organizations. We need to be negotiating at high level these shared commitments. Um, ideally, we would have aligned policies and processes around addressing racism um, and, you know, I think there, I could go into a whole lot around self-regulating professions uh, like <laughs> physician organizations and how they function actively to recreate the status quo instead of interrupt. One thing that I really, I hear all the time across the country is you can't fire physicians. Uh, and I think we really need to be willing to challenge that, that actually providing services uh, in a healthcare setting that's called privileges, right? Hospital privileges is in fact a privilege that comes with responsibilities. Uh, and so I think we need to work across as well our professional organizations and increase our accountability to the impacts, the outcomes and the care that we deliver uh, as opposed to how those organizations currently seem to function to recreate the status quo. Thanks, Sharon. It's so, just one o'clock right now. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we uh, will end it there. Thank you for filling the room uh, and for your participation. Uh, we are going to take a 30 minute break and then the workshop will start at 1.30, which will be more uh, building on this and more interactive around how you're going to go away from here and have these conversations uh, in your circles. So thank you again for coming. Oh, yeah.